Sorry. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Paul. Paul, did you do it? All right. Okay, cool. All right, let's get started. So, for those who don't know, RLOS is this program. We this is the third year we're running it, um, where we have some students that we pair with mentors here in MSR, and together they work on a project for the summer. Um, and so, this year we had four great students. Really excited. Um, there was some amazing things produced, and I'm really excited for everyone to see what they did, and for to give them the opportunity to share. Um, so the format for this is 10 minute presentation each and then five minutes or so for Q&A um, bring us through to the hour. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, Shakun, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Let me share my screen. Can you show, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, this is Shao Kun. Zhang, I'm one of the, the participants of ROS 2022 and also a first year PhD student. Uh, my project is uh, AutoML extensions in Volpo Rabbit, uh, which is mentored by Griffin. Uh, it is a great honor to make the final presentation here. Uh, so let's start. Uh, so first, I will give a small introduction to the AutoML and the AutoML in Volpo Rabbit. Uh, what is it, why we need it, uh, how it works. Uh, this is a traditional machine learning process. Uh, first, I will introduce uh, the concept of important concept, hyperparameters. Uh, it is a very generic term uh, which can be extended to a lot of aspects in machine learning process. Uh, for example, uh, how to do model selections, uh, what kind of feature interactions we need, how to set the learning rate, and so on. Uh, as you can see, uh, the traditional machine learning development uh, model development process uh, is given a task. The expert choose a set of hyperparameters, and uh, based on the hyperparameters, they construct uh, models, uh, conduct the performance evaluations, and uh, then, uh, based on the performance, they retune the hyperparameters and uh, uh, try another hyperparameter. Uh, this is called uh, a trail, and uh, it is uh, it is a loop. Uh, from manually hyperparameter tuning to model performance evaluation. This loop is executed by human beings. Uh, in such a traditional uh, development process, there exist some problems. Uh, I conclude these three points. The first point is uh, there are so many repeatedly work uh, in actual scenario. Uh, the hyperparameter tuning loop uh, occupies most of experts' energies. Uh, Comparing to put more effort on designing the core algorithm, uh, manually hyperparameter tuning is meaningless. And uh, we think, uh, from the perspective of efficiency, we think uh, the expert should focus more on the design of the core algorithm uh, rather than uh, repeatedly work. Uh, and uh, the second point is the existence of hyperparameter tuning uh, raises the bar for a machine learning application development. Uh, it is because tuning the hyperparameter heavily de relies on the human's prior knowledge. Uh, if we could lower the bar, uh, maybe the machine learning uh, community will be uh, expanded a lot and a lot of people will join us. And the second point is uh, manually hyperparameter tuning is a waste of current computation resources. Uh, so, uh, with the de development uh, of technology and computer, uh, may, uh, for example, the supercomputer, uh, when talking about uh, heavy work, uh, the first thing we need to consider is uh, whether can we solve the same problems, uh, leverage the computer. So, manually hyperparameter tuning is not a good thing. Uh, so that is why the, the, the existence of AutoML algorithm. Uh, using a common expressions, the AutoML algorithm is to replace humans' efforts uh, in the loop of performance evaluations to hyperparameter selections uh, with computer uh, computations. Uh, now let me introduce uh, how AutoML works. So for traditional AutoML, uh, uh, traditional machine learning development, uh, when getting the performance of of a particular set of hyperparameters, the expert will choose the next uh, hyperparameters. That is called a, a, a trail based uh, according to the performance evaluations. Uh, but this uh, is totally executed by the uh, humans or expert. Uh, 
and it uh, for currently we want a uh, algorithm to automatically uh, to do this process uh, we use some uh, auto ml algorithms for example uh, the uh, Bayesian optimization uh, Gaussian process uh, use le we leverage these mathematic tools to help me to conduct this repeat work. Uh, in this way, we could avoid uh, repeat uh, and we, we manually hyperparameter tuning and free people from the problems we illustrate in the last page. But also, this is a small challenge that is uh, the computing cost is n times bigger compared with the general model learning process uh, and represents the number of trails. So uh, now let's, let us move on the uh, automail invoper rabbit. Uh, basically, uh, the automail invoper rabbit uh, is used in the contextual bandit problem. The primary goal is to provide user with a hands-off method. Uh, to get an uh, optimal learning configurations uh, without pro knowledge using uh, Wolper Rabbit or in deep understanding of their own task or data set. Uh, more specifically, uh, uh, for, for example, if a person who are not uh, familiar with feature interactions and uh, their data set, it may be hard for them to design a good uh, feature interaction strategies for their own tasks. So. The hyperparameter is a basic contact concept in automail in VW. So uh, we in, in current implementations, uh, it represents a set of interactions that will be excluded from the default configurations. In previous versions, the default configurations is all quadratic feature interactions. Uh, the Ex exclusion set is empty. For example, if the namespace is ABC, uh, the feature interactions will be AA, AB, AC, BB, BC, CC, and its configurations is the empty set. So uh, for other configurations, exclusion set will contain uh, namespace interactions which will be removed from the full quadratic set. Uh, for example, in the configuration one, uh, it is AA, uh, the feature interactions will be A, B, A, C, B, 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 C, and C, C. Uh, so the, the pro now let me introduce the motivations uh, of this project, what we need to do, and uh, the challenge of this project. The uh, Basically, the primary goal of this project is to automate to support the cubic interactions. As I illustrated in the previous page, current only support uh, uh, quadratic interactions, not uh, cubic. Uh, so there exist some problems. For example, if some applications or data set relies on uh, cubic interactions, the current uh, implied current version cannot work. Uh, and uh, the cubic interactions has a more richer search space or feature interactions or portions. Uh, its portions uh, are exponentially richer comparing to quadratic. And uh, moreover, from the perspective of consistency, uh, other parts in VW support cubic interactions, but automail does not. So we need to make automail support cubic uh, also. Uh, these uh, are some challenges. Uh, the first is that the data structures of configurations or hyperparameters can only store quadratic interactions, not cubic. Uh, it is two-dimensional. Uh, moreover, as I illustrated before, the configurations is a basic element, so there exists a lot of content to change. And at last, we need to rewrite all corresponding uh, unit tests. Uh, next, I will introduce my work in detail. Uh, on the left part of this page, uh, these are some important parts that needs to change or rewrite if we want automail to support cubic. Uh, including the automail setup process, the data pre-process. Pre I also need to uh, write some uh, new functions to generate new uh, feature interactions. And also rewrite the config oroc. Config oroc is the core part, maybe one of the most important part in automail algorithm uh, in VW. And the other YouTube data structures and the unit test. Uh, as you can see uh, in the on the right. Letting you have one minute left. Uh, in the red part of this page is my roadmap uh, to work on this project. First, 
uh, I need to change the data structure of the configurations, uh, and I need to make the new structures compatible with quadratic and both quadratic and cubic, and modify the corresponding utils. This is a pre-request of the next stage. Second, I need to work on the cubic. Uh, next, I will show my progress. Uh, so basically, I open up two PR to complete my project, and both of them have been merged into the main uh, branch. And the first PR is to change the data structure of configurations to make it support both cubic and quadratic. And the second PR is work on the cubic interactions for automail. Uh, at last, uh, it is uh, test and results in the default simulation functions. Uh, the simulation environment. Uh, finally, I will introduce my future plan. Uh, I learned a lot from this project and uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity and the help from Griffin. Uh, there are two remain uh, research open problems to be solved in the futures. Uh, these problems are non-trivial and uh, may require some deep thinking. The first is uh, meaningful to design a new config oracle, and the second is to design a good uh, method to verify whether uh, Challenger is better than Champion in automail algorithm. Uh, that is all. Thank you, and sorry for the delay. <laughs> Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a question. Wait, don't go. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so Shokan, are you, were you able to get to the point where we can compare um, having the cubic versus quadratic interaction and to see which one performs better on certain data sets, or we did not get that far in your summer project? Uh, uh, I did not. Uh, I, I put a lot of effort to find a good benchmark uh, to compare the cubic, cubic and the quadratic, uh, but uh, honestly, I do not find a very uh, appropriate data set to test. But I think uh, the quadrat in cubic indeed have more richer feature interactions. And uh, I think there may exist some data set can really work. Cubic works better than cubic, uh, than quadratic. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm, OK. All right, Eveline, feel free to go ahead when you're ready. Oh, OK, thank you. Thanks. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Yep. OK, thank you. So hi, my name is Ivolin Gong. I'm going into my second year um, of my PhD at the University of Vermont this fall. And today I'll be giving a talk uh, about my reinforcement learning open source first project titled Compiler Optimization with Reinforcement Learning, where I worked with my mentor, Wagda Zhang. And uh, so most of us know what the compiler is, I guess. So a compiler is like a program that translate, translates source code into executable binaries, like assembly or byte code. And it does this in six steps. And we are going to be focusing on the optimization step here, where um, optimization, the goal of optimization is to produce a semantically equivalent program that uses fewer resources. And this could be making the program execute faster, use less memory or power, and um, many other optimization goals. And this can lead to several benefits like um, significant performance improvements. This uh, tons of money can be saved in as the operational cost of large data centers can reduce drastically. And then we can have reduced development time and it, it can lead to efficient deployment in uh, devices like embedded, in embedded devices or mobile devices because they have a tight um, budget for code size and other stringent requirements. So traditional compilers use different um, strategy, optimization strategies like dead code elimination, vectorization, um, loop invariant code motion like that's LICM, you have inlining and many other optimization strategies which are implemented as optimization passes in the compiler. So for example, 
you can have like they're implemented as flags, like if flag one, flag two, and like in that order. And the problem of finding the the optimal sequence for uh, for optimize for the optimization phase is called the phase ordering problem, and that is the problem we are trying to address. So um, consider the example on the screen, the example code on the screen where it, we, this is just a simple program that is trying to normalize a vector and it has a runtime of theta n squared. So now let's try to optimize this code using two passes in different orders. So first we can we can do the LICM, uh, which allows us to move the this flag to, to move this function out of the loop. So we can move this uh, mark function above the loop and this brings down the runtime to theta of n. Now, if you apply the inlining, where inlining is simply replacing this mark function with the, the, the call to the mark function with the function itself, we get we still get some um, runtime advantages, but it's still theta of n. So if we do the opposite and implement, um, say we do the opposite and, and apply LICM first, in the opposite order is and then uh, inlining first and then LICM later. We are going to get, we are not going to get the same, um, we're going to get maybe theta of n squared. And this example is just shows that the order in which optimi optimization phases are applied can be the difference between the program running in theta of n squared and theta of n. So it's a, an important problem to solve. So modern compilers use predefined sequences to, that are developed by compiler experts. And these experts spend lots of hours developing heuristics and tuning compiler knobs to meet these optimi optimization goals. But these predefined sequences are static because the same sequence is run for all programs. And so it doesn't generalize well. And in some scenarios, it may even degrade the performance of the programs. Some basic um, approaches like exhaustive search, um, exist to find better sequences, but um, the optimization space is generally unbounded and is high dimensional. So it is not feasible to exhaustively search through all these possible sequences. Another approach can be random search, which is also impractical. And then we also have greedy search, which evaluates all possible actions and selects the actions with the, uh, that provides the greatest reward. The graph on the left shows um, the results that we got on greedy search that is run on, on like we run 50 random programs uh, for 10 steps and an average it takes an average of about 30 seconds for each program to run so we compare the results that we got with the OZ flag which um, is one of the default sequence optimization passes um, on the LLVM compiler and she's designed to provide more code size reduction. So on the y-axis, if you, let's say we get a value of two on the y-axis, what that means is the OZ flag um, leads to a code size reduction of 100. If the, if the OZ flag leads to a code size reduction of 100, then our method um, has a reduction of 200. So um, in order for a, any approach we are looking at to, to outperform the LLVM compiler, the results here should be greater than one on this graph. So we see here that uh, greedy search, the results vary, like its performance is not too bad, but it takes like a long time to be able to get any useful result. So, um, sorry. So we decide to, um, this brings us to our approach where we formulate our this problem as a reinforcement learning problem. So in a typical uh, reinforcement learning scenario, an agent takes actions in an environment, which is then interpreted into a reward and a representation of the state, and that is fed back into the agent. And the agent learns through experience, exploring different actions and recording rewards and observations. So in order to, to formulate this method, we need um, five things we need an environment we need an action we need a reward and we need states observations so in in this in our problem the actions are the optimization path that we want to apply to the program 
and the observations and intermediate representations of programs and the results after an action is applied. Then the reward can be the code size or the runtime. In our case, we are focusing on the code size in our experiments. And the agent is the model that we, we are building that's going to interact with the environment. So, um, as I earlier mentioned, the number of possible actions is unbounded and it is high, high, um, it has a high dimension. So, for example, in the LLVM compiler, which is the environment we are using, uh, we have 124 actions, that's optimization passes. So, for a sequence length of CN, we are going to have N to the 124 combination, possible combinations, which is very large and can take a lot of time to train. So we could reduce the action set by using um, um, actions that were chosen by compiler experts. So for example, in most of our experiments, we use um, 42 actions instead of 124 that were chosen by previous work. Or we could use um, heuristics that also are uh, also set by compiler experts. So for example, we could test every action and only include actions that have an effect on the original source code. So the algorithms we we try out, we we implement contextual bandwidth using VW. Um, we formulate this as an episodic problem where n steps map to n optimization passes. And our, in this case, our context is the program features and the multi-step history. We also look at other um, the reinforcement learning algorithms, deep learning based mostly. We use like the DQ networks and some of its variants like double DQ. We look at DQN Rainbow, DQN Do. We also look at value-based networks like Proxima, Proxima Policy Optimization, PPO, and actor critic networks like A2C and A3C. And we use, most of these were implemented in the RLLIP library, which we used. Um if one minute remaining. Oh, okay. So preliminary results. We um, I should mention that we use Compiler Gym, which is a library that provides like different environments and benchmark data sets, different observation spaces that we used to. That was very helpful. So here you can see the summary of our results. We are looking into several representations, but here we only have the auto phase um, observation space. And the, the, these are the results on the validation and the test sets. We get the best results from PPO here, as you can see, which outperforms the default compiler. So this red line indicates the default compiler in both the validation and test sets. Also, we we, we see that the multi-step um, contextual bandwidth, double DQN, and uh, the rainbow, they also um, perform well in the validation set, but not so well in the test set. So they don't generalize well because the test set is this is 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 an it's like a whole held out data set that the compiler did not see during training. Um, we also have we kind of zoom in into the PPO results on individual programs in both the validation and the test sets, and we can see that the results are not the best on almost half of the programs because they only slightly, like on the test set, they only slightly perform better than the OZ flag, but they are also very good on the validation set. PPO, we can see that PPO doesn't generalize well on all the programs, and sometimes it even um, degrades the performance. So to summarize, um, optimizing compilers using machine learning is a very promising approach. However, with our reinforcement learning approach, Training is time consuming. It's yeah, generalizing is challenging, probably because the observation features are not sufficient to give better generalization. And the data sets may not be very representative of all programs. So we are experimenting with these ideas and thinking about different ways to perform feature engineering um, on the uh, intermediate representation because our results are only as good as our data. And we also intend to look into joint optimization uh, for both code size and runtime, because the program with the smallest code size is not necessarily the fastest. And yeah, this thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I learned a lot about reinforcement learning, especially implementing them, implementing it practically. And I would like to thank my mentor as well. He was very helpful. Thank you. A few minutes for questions. 
Uh, I guess I, I missed it. Uh, so in this case, what was your reward? Was it code size or was it runtime? Uh, yes, so we, yeah, the, the, the reward was the code size. Okay. Yes. And what, what features did you use to represent the program? Yeah, we, 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 we used um, auto phase, which is um, the, 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 um, we, auto phase, you, okay, we used um, features from the auto phase, like there's a previous work, okay, those were the actions. We use features from the compiler gym. So compiler gym provides us um, different features that we could use that represent programs. Yeah. So we just um, used one of the observation species. So they have different observation species that we could use okay. as the features. Any other questions? Any online? No. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So next up we have Shavani. You're on mute, Shavani. It's very late for her. Yeah. So awesome. Uh, hello Thank everyone. You. So I I'm Sharvani. So I would be presenting our work of a passer support in Wapal Wabbit. Uh, this project is a part of reinforcement learning open source fest 20. And my mentor is Rajan Chari. Uh, so I am a senior year undergraduate student studying at National Technology Karnataka. So the motivation behind this. So flat buffer is an efficient cross platform serialization library for languages including C++, C sharp, C go. So we can define the object types in the schema. We compile to low overhead serializer and DC. DC. Optionally, JSON data that matches the schema can also be dynamically passed into buffers. So the experimental support for flat buffer was added in the RLOS 2020 project. Uh, so this was improving the flat buffer passer support in Wobbel Wabbit, which can in turn optimize the performance. So this project are uh, compiling VW in Windows, changing the flat buffer schema to be column based instead of uh, to reduce the serialized file size, measuring the serialized size and performance before and after, changing the experiments and presenting the results. So I hope I'm audible. Uh, my voice is clear. OK, so. Approach for this is to change flat buffer schema to be column based uh, instead of row based. So the performance under different conditions such as uh, different aid cases. So we have uh, for we take we have an on and off for all. And we have 10 actions, for example, and. Uh, we have different combinations of features. Uh, numerical features, categorical features, namespaces for these cases. So format better. So tables, unlike struct, are not stored in line in their parent, but they are referred by offset. So but why not struct? Because we cannot have default values and we cannot have deprecated fields in standard flat buffers. So structs can never change size without breaking support for schema evolution. Vectors are one dimensional blocks where each element is self contained or stores reference to table or string based on schema type of in, type information. So the main point is that vectors, uh, if the uh, fields in the vectors are scalars, so they can be stored in a contiguous fashion as contiguous blocks. So a set of tables. So, uh, this slide explains the extra overhead in tables for each row. So I won't get details in the interest of time, but we can use a lot of indirection in the case of tables. So this is a flat buffer schema before. So we have example collection and in each exam uh, collection, we have uh, different examples. In each example, we can have multiple namespaces each namespace we can we can have multiple features this was 
schema before. And we also have a label inside each example, which is a union. Uh, it can CB or multi, etc. So the we can see get into more details uh, regarding the feature. So we can see that it contains the name, value, and hash uh, in the schema before. Schema after instead of having a feature table, a feature names, feature value, hashes, vectors. So a change, and so results. So uh, so. This graph shows the this plot shows the size figure in so this shows the file size in MB. So we multiple cases and we can see that in the for the modified flat buffer the size in MB is uh, reduced. So we can see that for case two, case four, case six, and case eight, it's not significantly lesser because we have the audit option on. We have strings. And in case one, case three, case five, case seven, uh, where we have the audit option off, uh, or where the flat buffer doesn't contain strings, the file size is significantly reduced to the original one. It's it. Uh, read performance on wind. So this shows the time in seconds for case one. So the modif the time taken for modified flash uh, is approximately as that for the cache for reading a file. Reading a file, I mean. This, the, this slide shows the result for measuring the read performance to SL2. So, so this is the graph showing the wall clock time in seconds and for this, so we have case one case two to case eight and we can see that the uh, performance of, of flat buffers in case one case three case five case seven is uh, of modified flat buffer is significantly better than the original one in these cases compared to the uh, case two case four case six and case uh, eight because we have on in these cases. And so this is the profiling done using wall grind, call grind. So this shows the uh, uh, number of, so in the original flat buffer, we had a number of instructions compared to the modified flat buffer. Uh, number of instructions for passing reduced in the modified flat buffer. So note that this cost associated with reading and writing up in the profile. So as these are non CPU intensive tasks. So this won't contain the instructions for the input out IO thread. It contains, uh, it focuses on the uh, results re uh, related to the learning and learner and passer threads. So I would like to show a quick demo. So I have two uh, open. So one is, this is for the model buffer and this is for the original flat buffer. So, so I would like to, I would be measuring the time taken for the modified flat buffer, the cache option on. And we would be having time taken for the original flat buffer. So you can see that in that one, the time taken is lesser than uh, the original one. So we can see the use the real or the wall clock time in the cases. Just to do a sanity check, we can also check that loss here is minus 20 uh, to the 255 and here also is the same. And the number of exams are also same in both the cases. This are also same. The cache, cache, so the time taken would be significant, uh, would be lesser. So it's two, three seconds. The volume. So coming to my, 
So uh, I got to learn a lot. I flat buffer, C++, design pattern, working on a large code base, open source, CMake, go to performance profiling use tools. I also got to use Wabbit itself. Uh, I got into reinforcement learning uh, 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 program and also got, got to learn more about contextual bandits, reduction stack, etc. So the uh, would be error handling, profile, profiling and optimizing for other cases, seeing the creation of flat buffers, explore cache format with flat buffer for saving the VW model file as flat buffer. I'd like to thank uh, Rajan Chari for me throughout this uh, summer. I would also like to thank uh, uh, all of you for paying attention, so for giving me this opportunity. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? I had one question um, on the the uh, time comparison between the flat buffers and the cache. Um, were, was the cache actually serializing strings in this case, or were those just being dropped off? Uh, yeah, I think they were. Uh, they mostly dropped off. Okay, so the, the, I didn't add yes. options for that. Yeah, so the audit uh, cases are not particular, like really valid because they're not testing the same thing here. But the, the cool thing about this to me is that the, the flat buffer can both perform at the same level as the cache when it's not saving strings, yep. but then it has the flexibility of also being able to save strings it, when you want to. Yeah. So like it fulfills you know both use cases while not losing performance in like the fast case. Yeah. Which is really cool to see. So I'll look more into it and I'll get back to you. All right, thanks. Yeah, this is cool. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. And we'll move on to the last one, Songlin. Okay, so. Share my screen and so can you see this? Yep, looks good. Okay, so hi everyone. It's an honor to give a presentation here. My project at the ROS Fest 2022 is to add a native CSV parsing feature for the VW. And to make a brief self introduction about me, this is Sonny Zhang speaking from China. I recently got my bachelor's degree in computer science at Anjou University and also an incoming student in security and cloud computing Erasmus Mentors joint master's program. And where I will start my first year at Aalto University in Finland this fall. So, why do I choose to implement native CSV parsing? Firstly, CSV is one of the most popular file formats used in the machine learning dataset and is often delivered as a default format in competitions such as Kaggle. And secondly, CSV files have the same schema for each example, while VW text format doesn't. Thirdly, although converters in Python have been written which convert these files to VW text format, it would be convenient if VW could understand CSV files natively. And finally, I also want to challenge myself as there is a surprising amount of complexity in the design of implementing a generalized parser for CSV. So this project is as much about considering all of the design pieces as implementing a working parser. My choice and time devoted also pay off since my project has already got merged into the VW upstream. And here we show some sample CSV files with the same content and different separators. You can check the corresponding table for their meanings. 
CSC files are often separated by commas. However, alternative delimiter separated files are often given a .csv extension despite using a non-comma field separator. Semicolons are often used instead of commas in many European locales to use the comma as the demicolon separator. So we follow the RFC 4180 and MIME standards for the puzzle. Its requirements are as follows. So firstly, lines will end with CR or CRF characters, and it is optional for the last line. And secondly, CSV files can have an optional header record. There is no sure way to detect whether it is present, so care is required when importing. And thirdly, each record should contain the same number of separated fields. And fourthly, any field may be quoted with double quotes. Fifthly, fields containing a double quote or commas should be quoted. And the last one, if double quotes are used to enclose fields, then a double quote in a field must be represented by two double quote characters. So next, we will dig into the details. The first one is that we allow specifying the CSV field separator. Default is a comma. The double quote, vertical bar, and colon are re reserved and not allowed to be used. Since the double quote is for escape, the vertical bar for separating the name space and feature names, and the colon are, can be used in labels. And the second, for each separated field, auto remove the auto quote, double quote of a cell when it pairs. Separator symbols inside the double quoted cells are not a separator, but a regular string character. And the third one, double quotes appearing at the cell start and end will be considered to enclose fields. Other quotes that appear elsewhere and out of the enclosed fields will have no special meaning. The fourth, if double quotes are used to enclose fields, then a double quote appearing inside a field must be escaped by preceding it with another double quote and will remove that escape symbol during parsing. The fifth, use header line for feature names and possibly namespaces. Specify label and tag using underscore label and underscore tag. Each separated field in the header, except for tag and label, may contain namespace and feature names separated by the vertical bar. And the sixth, we can override the CSV header by providing the new header. Combined with CSV no file header, we assume that there is no header in the CSV file and specifying the CSV header is a must. The seventh, if the number of the separated fields for the current parsing line is greater than the header, an error will be thrown. And the eighth, train the fields for ASCII, white space, and some UDF8 BOM characters before separation. The ninth, if no namespace is separated, we'll use an empty namespace. The tenth, separator supports using backslash T to represent tabs. Otherwise, an error will be thrown if assigned more than one character. The eleventh, directly read the label as a string and interpret it using the VW label parser. The 12th, it will try to judge if the feature values are float or string. Suppose not a number, it will be considered as a string. Quoted numbers are always considered as strings. The 13th, if the feature value is empty, it will skip that feature. The 14th, reset the parser when the EOF of a file is met for possible multiple input file support. We also support using CSV NS value to scale the namespace values by specifying the load ratio. The last one, 
if all the cells in a line are empty, then consider it an empty line. CSV is not a good fit for the multi-line format, as evidenced by many empty fields. The multi-line format often means different lines have different scammers. However, I still leave the empty line support to ensure that it's flexible and extendable. In this case, users can still express multi-line examples in CSV files, although it is not listed as supported. We still throw an error if number of fields separated by the line doesn't match the previous, even if all the fields are empty, as this drawing means typos that users may not intend. So some statistics to share. The project reaches 100% test and code coverage. On my computer, it takes only 829 milliseconds to handle 200,000 examples, which is comparable to the equivalent VW custom format data files parsing speed of 603 milliseconds, and is equivalent to 21.7 megabytes per second throughput. Something to mention that I have expected that's a little bit of slower for the CSV parser. The text parser can parse as it reads since generally the elements have a fixed position, while CSV parser needs to store the split elements into an array and look up that array according to the header for labels, tags, namespace, and feature values. Also, there's double codes, trimming, and escaping support, which will def definitely cost more time. After all, I have tried my best to optimize it, and the performance is also to my satisfaction. The performance improved 10 times than before when I started working for optimization. <laughs> so finally, the demo, as you can see, we have the VW custom format and the CSV format representing the sensing here. You can specify that we are parsing the CSV file by appending the corresponding parameter. And you can see the results. So there you will have the same output. And that's all. Thanks for listening. And special thanks to my mentor, Jack Jarris and Peter Chong, who helped me a lot during the project. So any questions? I have a, I have a question. Yeah, OK. This is Rajan. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, so you mentioned that CSV is not a good, uh, multi-line formats don't work very well in CSV. Yeah. Is there yeah. is there a way to think about it that that might work? For example, could you say uh, have multiple sections in CSV with multiple headers? Yeah, I have considered that, but for the compat for traditional CSV format, since having multiple headers will change the tradition. I say the the RF the the the, the RFC four one A zero format, so mm -hmm. that will not be compatible. So I just this one. Thank yeah. You. So oh. any other questions? Has this been merged to Masters yep, so now yep. people can use it? Yes, yeah, this is merged and it will be yeah. in the next release. Very nice. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. We've we've reached the end. Um, I just want to quickly say thank you to everyone for coming to show your support and watch the presentations. Uh, and thank you to um, the few students who stayed up late to present at this. Really appreciate you coming here and showing us your work. So um, thank yeah. you, everyone.
Just wanted to thank again our RLOS students. Uh, you always bring such fresh perspectives to our team and you put in time and effort on this project. So thank you all. We had an awesome time, I think, hosting you this summer. I hope you learned and had fun as well. And thank you, Jack, for uh, you know leading this program for us every summer. So big thank you to you too. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome.